Good morning and welcome to Hope Lutheran Church in Chino Valley, Arizona. We're glad you joined us either in person or virtually this morning. And today we continue our message series that we started after Christmas for the Epiphany season, and that is Roadblocks to a Blessed New Year. Today we're going to talk about the roadblock of fear and see that Jesus is the one who removes our fear, especially the terror that comes from God's law. God bless your worship this morning, and we begin with the very first hymn today, How Good Lord to Be Here. Please arise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. <clears throat> for the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. 
The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Lord God, before the suffering and death of your one and only Son, you revealed his glory on the holy mountain. Grant that we who here bear the cross on earth may behold by faith the light of his heavenly glory and so be changed into his likeness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson for the transfiguration of Jesus comes to us from the second book of the Kings, chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, where we see how one of the three people that were with the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah, how God miraculously took him into heaven. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah was traveling with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord is taking your master away from you? Then he said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here because the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord is taking your master away from you? He said, Yes, I know. Be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here because the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Then fifty men from the sons of the prophets came and stood and watched them from a distance, with the two of them standing at the Jordan. Elijah took a cloak, folded it together, and struck the water. The water divided to the right and to the left. Then the two of them crossed on dry land. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask me for whatever I can do for you before I am taken from you. Then Elisha said, Let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. He said, You have asked for a difficult thing. If you see me being taken from you, it will surely be yours. But if not, then it will not. While they were walking and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire came and separated them. So Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. 
Elisha was watching and crying out, My father, my father, Israel's chariot and its charioteers. Then he did not see him anymore. This is the word of our God. Today our psalm is Psalm 148, and I ask you to read the refrain and the psalm together with me in unison. Forever let us sing the goodness of the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels, <coughs> all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Forever let us sing the goodness of the Lord. Praise the Lord from the earth lightning and hail, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord. For his splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Forever let us sing the goodness of the Lord. Our second lesson for today comes to us from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, Chapter, the beginning with chapter 3, verse 12. Please arise for our second reading. The Old Testament law, the writer to the Hebrews says, is a picture that covers the glory of God because it's the Old Testament law code in this context. But Christ came and fulfilled that law, removing the veil. So now those who believe in the gospel can shine with the glory of Christ as they live for him and proclaim him. Therefore, since we have this kind of hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. In spite of this, their minds were hardened. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains when the Old Testament is read. It has not been removed because it is taken away only in Christ. Instead, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into his own image from one degree of glory to another. This too is from the Lord who is the Spirit. Therefore, since we have this ministry as a result of the mercy shown us, we are not discouraged. On the contrary, we have renounced shameful and underhanded methods. We do not operate in a deceitful way, and we do not distort the word of God. Instead, by proclaiming the truth clearly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This is God's word. Please be seated, and we're going to sing a newer song now, Jesus Take Us to the Mountain.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Savior Jesus Christ who has loved us with an everlasting love and through his love removes our fears. Amen. Since Christmas time, during this Epiphany season, we've been looking at the roadblocks that stand in the way of our faith and our hope and our futures. There are many things that stand as roadblocks to our faith, and if they are not taken down, destroyed, they will put us on a detour that leads us to eternal punishment in hell. As we listen to God's word during these weeks, we have also been blessed to see Jesus for who he really is. When he lived in this world, he didn't appear like the God of creation, did he? But in order to redeem us, in order to save us, to take away and remove our guilt, he needed to humble himself and become obedient to death, even death on the cross. And that's what our Savior did. But there remains one more roadblock that we need to talk about today, a roadblock that needs to be torn down, a roadblock of fear that so often rises in our lives. We live in a time of very much uncertainty. Pandemic is still kind of going around trying to kill people. And we have a world in turmoil, whether that's our country or throughout the countries of the globe. And fear is what the devil likes to stir up between peoples and inside of us. So today we're going to go to Jesus' transfiguration in a very unlikely place. We're going to find fear and see how Jesus removes the roadblock of fear. Our text for today is Mark's account of the transfiguration, starting in verse 2 of chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. <clears throat> Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is God's word. Today, we tackle the roadblock of fear. But before we do that, it's probably wise for us to take a look at what is the source of fear. Where does fear come from? Well, you wouldn't expect it if you took a day trip with Jesus. After all, he's the savior of the world. He's the creator. And if Jesus is with us, what's the fear, right? Well, on a particular day, about six months before Jesus went to the cross, he took his three inner disciples, Peter, James, and John, with them on a day trip, so to speak, up a mountain. They went hiking. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were alone by themselves. There he was transfigured. The Greek word there is metamorphosized, like a caterpillar into a butterfly. So it's a change about appearance from his state of humiliation. They saw him now in his state of glory. There he was transfigured in front of them. His clothes became radiant, dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And after six days, after... Oh, I went backwards, sorry. The disciples were there with Jesus, who now is transformed into his glory. And they could not handle that. On that simple day trip, 
it turned out to be different than what they were used to with Jesus. I mean, they had just spent two and a half years learning from Jesus, speaking with him, living with him, basically, going here, there, and everywhere. They saw Jesus do miracles, but they never saw him in his glory. Oh, they saw the works of God, but not God. Well, on this particular day, when Jesus is transformed, they see Jesus in his splendor, the way we will see him one day in heaven. And so the day trip turned into a trip that they didn't expect at all. No wonder they were terrified. The terror of the disciples is pretty obvious, isn't it? And it wasn't unlike that of Moses, the lawgiver, who was there that day, right, with Elijah and Jesus. When he went up another mountain to be with God in his glory, that was Mount Sinai, remember? He went up there to receive the law of God from God's own hand that God wrote with his own finger, the Testament says. (coughs) The text tells us from Exodus 24, when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. If you follow this text, it says Moses was terrified. If God appeared to us right now in his glory, how many of us would go, ooh, this is good? Unless it's judgment day and God appeared right now, because we know he's with us. Jesus, if he appeared in his glory right now, I think we would fall over like we're dead too, just like those disciples did. On that day, in that unlikely place with Jesus, they became filled with terror because they saw the almighty glory of God. In fact, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And who can stand in the presence of a holy, just God? That is, if we're in our sin. In fact, God himself told Moses, nobody can look at me and live. There's cause for terror. So where do the fears come from that come into our lives, I wonder? Maybe it's the same thing, because when we listen to God's law, those commands things he says we must do and things we must not do, and look out if we don't listen, doesn't that law of God terrify us? You know, God created humans to be perfect. You all know the story. God didn't create people with flaws or weaknesses. He created them perfect in every possible way. They walked with God in the garden without any terror. But boy, did that change after they fell into sin. Not only were they ashamed, they hid from God as if that's possible. So what about us? We still listen to the law of God so we see what God wants of us in life. When he says, respect those that I've put in authority over you, and we don't, are we terrified? When he says, life is precious to me, in the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. How do we view things of life? The abuse of our bodies and things like that. The sixth commandment, which we're going to talk about more next week because it's the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, so I moved transfiguration up a week so we could talk about marriage and family next week. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery, but our minds wander. I could go down the line with the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and go all the way to the first. You shall have no other gods. And every time we sin, we put ourselves up as God. And what does God say if we violate his will? You die. The wages for sin is death. You die. Not just physically, eternally in hell. That ought to terrify us. <coughs> or at least ought to terrify our sinful natures. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And where do our fears come from? That's a holy, righteous fear that's good for us to have. 
But where are the other fears that come up in life? The fear of suffering, the fear of rejection, the fear of, well, you fill in the blank. It comes from sin too, doesn't it? What about fears that go on in the world, nation to nation, race to race, gender to gender? Where does that all come from? Come from sin. Because it's not about loving your neighbor as yourself, is it? The fears that come up into our life, some are godly because God wants us to be terrified by our sins, but others come because of our sins in our lives. How are we going to get rid of the roadblock of fear? Well, there is only one way to do that. There's an antidote to the fears that come into our lives. And you know the antidote very well, right? The antidote to fear is Jesus Christ and him alone. There is no one else that can remove our fears and the threats of, that come from fear that cause our fear. And that's the blessing that comes from being in the Lord's presence. I think this is an incredible story in the life of Jesus on earth. It obviously happened to Jesus because according to his human nature and in his state of humiliation, he was getting a real booster shot here. Six months later, he'd be on the cross. And so it was kind of like the final push. Let's give him a big dose here of an encouragement and on you go. It's not like Jesus didn't know he was true God, right? But God again assures him, as he did at his baptism, remember? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now he adds, listen to him. Listen to him. There's present, a blessing with God's presence Remember, Jesus promised, I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. And it was Jesus who said to us that where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm right there with you until the very end of the age. If Christ is for us, who can be against us? Why become afraid of anything? Well, we already said how that happens. But the antidote is Jesus Christ, isn't it? These disciples are down on the ground terrified And what does Jesus do? Jesus, who's in their presence, Matthew tells us in the other account, but Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Jesus there removes their fears, doesn't he? He tears down the roadblock of that fear so that they could stand up again and actually go down the mountain to do their job. That's the same message that Jesus gives his disciples on Easter Sunday, isn't it? They're terrified for fear of the Jews, it says. They're locked up in that room, wherever it was in Jerusalem, and Jesus appears among them. What's the first thing he says? Peace be to you. He removes their fears by his presence. Now there's a contrast that we learn from Hebrews here that I think it's important to remember. The law and the gospel have different purposes, don't they? The law's purpose is to condemn. It does terrorize us. The gospel's job? Forgiveness, freedom, faith, forever. Kind of cool, isn't it? The way the writer of the Hebrews said that, he said, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to burning fire, to darkness, to gloom, and a raging storm, to the sound of trumpet, and to a voice that spoke. He saw about Mount Sinai when Moses was up there, okay? Those who heard the voice asked that not one more word be added because they could not endure what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that even Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Now, we haven't gone to that mountain. That's where fear comes from. We've gone to a different one. He says, instead, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come into God's family by God's grace, where Christ dwells with us, his people, all the time. The antidote to fear is the gospel that says Jesus is with us. But it also comes in the blessing of hearing the gospel message And Elijah appeared to them together with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. The two Old Testament great prophets, Moses who gave the law, Elijah who made sure the law was revived 
about 600 years after Moses, about 800 years before Jesus. They're there talking with Jesus on the mountain. And what were they talking about? Well, we go to Luke's account of the transfiguration. We find out that the two men appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Elijah, Moses, both of them proclaimed the Christ who is coming to take away the sins of the world. Now they're talking with the guy that they were talking about back there when they lived in this world. And they were talking about Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. They were talking with Jesus so the disciples could hear the gospel message there that day. God keeps his promises to save and forgive. So what are we going to say about all this stuff, all these fears and things that come into our lives? What are we going to say about all that? Paul says, what then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? Indeed, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him graciously give us all things? Isn't that a wonderful blessing? To have Jesus in our presence because where two or three are gathered, I'm there with them. And for Jesus to be with us because he promises never to leave us or forsake us, for Jesus to give us day after day the forgiveness for our sins which removes our fear and terror that the law causes. To have Jesus who rose from the dead be there for us to say, as I have risen, you're going to rise. Even death doesn't bring terror to God's people. The roadblock of fear is debilitating. It can crush it can lead us to do things and say things that normally we wouldn't do and say because the emotions get so racked up by fear and terror. But Christ took all of those sins with him to the cross. God inflicted his full weight of punishment on him so that we could be in his presence now by faith with him forever in heaven. God raised his son from the dead so that we would have the assurance that these things that can cause us fear and terror in life will not last. Jesus lives. We are free, forgiven, his people. And so without fear, we can do what the disciples did, and that's proclaim Jesus. This is kind of interesting, and it happens a couple of times in the scripture at a miracle of Jesus. They were coming down from the mountain. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen. And he said that a couple different times. Uh, you could track that if you want. And we think, wait, wait a second, we're supposed to tell everybody about Jesus, right? But look at the word, until there. Until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. These three disciples, along with the rest of them, and the rest of believers at Jesus' time who experienced the resurrection, they saw Jesus alive. Then on Pentecost, they're empowered by the Spirit. They took the word to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, and that has been our commission too. Even pandemics and national crises and international problems cannot stop God's people from sharing the truth. Jesus Christ is our Savior. It's after his resurrection and before ours. And until the day comes when our time of grace ends, God puts us in the world. Jesus sends us to go and take the message of salvation to all people so that other people aren't afraid. Don't you realize that today, so many of the things that we're seeing are fueled by fear? Fear is being fostered by our news media. Jesus has overcome everything. Do not be afraid. God the Father said, it's my son. I'm pleased with him. Why? He accomplished what God sent him to do. Listen to him and then share that wonderful message with others. And so by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, proclaimed in the gospel, God tears down the roadblock of fear just like he tore down the roadblocks of sin and confusion and inflexibility and impenitence, those things we've been talking about. 
Jesus Christ, our living Savior, tears those roadblocks down so we are not detoured from the path to heaven. As pilgrims and sojourners in the world, travelers on the road to heaven, do not be afraid. Trust in God. Put your faith in Jesus and the terror of this life. Even the terror of death will never get you. Please arise now and join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we continue to walk through this life, we realize that our sin and the sins of the world and the devil himself put up roadblocks to our faith and to our eternal happiness with you and heaven. Lord, continue to tear down those roadblocks with your gospel. Even when your law terrifies us and causes great fear because we recognize that we are not perfect we have not lived up to your demands. Lord, refresh us with your gospel that you have punished Jesus in our place for those sins and have restored us to life and salvation by his resurrection. Lord, keep us your people. Remove all those roadblocks for your name's sake and our eternal welfare in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we continue now with the confession of the Christian faith. We do that with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made <clears throat> of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we pray. We praise you, O Father, for the precious gift of your Son and for his glorious transfiguration on the holy mountain. Give us the firm resolve to listen to your Son the eager readiness to believe his promises and the joyful willingness to heed his commandments. By the sign of Moses and Elijah, show us that the blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, for they shall know the power of Christ's resurrection and shall be changed from glory into glory. O God and Father, let your Holy Spirit find a dwelling in our poor bodies and transform our weak sinful lives into the radiance of goodness, purity, and righteousness. Transform our minds, our understanding, our judgments, yes, even our whole persons, to reflect the mind of Christ. Tear down all the roadblocks to our eternal welfare, that we might walk the path to heaven with faith and hope and trust. Take our sickness and pain, our disappointments and despair, our sorrows and mourning, our pride and anger, our selfishness and envy, our hate and fear. Take all these, O Father, and transform them by the healing touch of Jesus into noble impulses, pure motives, kind thoughts, constructive deeds, high courage, and a true faith. Lord, now also hear us as we bring to you our private petitions and prayers. <clears throat> Lord,
Look on your church, O Lord, here and in every place, and grant that we all who bear the name of Christ may daily offer up to you the acceptable sacrifices of repentance, thanksgiving, and loving obedience. Hear our prayer, and by your mercy grant our petitions for Jesus' sake, who also taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated as we listen now to our Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary Choir Sing, O Sing Jubilee to the Lord, as we conclude our live stream worship. O sing Jubilee to the Lord, every man, glory, glory to you, God, O serve Him with gladness as in His souls we stand, sing praises to God out of sight. Thanks for worshiping with us today here at Hope Lutheran Church. And as always, if you have any comments or thoughts, please forward them to us through the emails provided uh, on our website. And God grants you a safe and blessed week, and we'll see you next Sunday as we talk about on Valentine's Day, talk about marriage and family. God bless you all. <laughs>